Hello and welcome to Screen Jumper, a series of video essays that explores the convergence of films and video games. My name is Aaron Julian, and today I want to talk about the goals of this series and how I plan to examine both video games and films. There's a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. This series is born out of a love for both films and video games that I have, and the desire to see them come together in harmony to make something even more awesome, like a Scorsese Kojima gumbo, or something. You get it. But why is it that this kind of synergy is so rare? Or rather, why are awful game or film adaptations so abundant? Before we find any answers, it's important to note the critical differences in the way films and games express themselves. First, we need to lay down some groundwork about just what films and games are. Time for some definitions. I'll start with the foolish assumption that all art is an argument. All that means is that every piece of art has rhetoric, something to say. So if all art is argument, and we make another foolish assumption that video games are art, that means games have something to say, right? Absolutely. Just like books do, just like paintings do, and just like films do. The important thing to remember is that each of these things expresses its rhetoric in different ways, and it's crucial to understand these different methods of expression when you're talking about how they mix or fail to do so in the attempt. For the purposes of this series, I define a film as a visual or audiovisual experience communicated via the techniques of film theory. Pretty straightforward. A film wants to say something, and it uses cinematic techniques such as camera angles, lighting, editing, sound, and a whole bucket full of other familiar techniques to say it. There's no shortage of opinion of what makes a game a game, so in writing the following definition, I tried to be as inclusive as possible, yet specific enough to distinguish games from other media. Break out your wallets because there's a lot of $20 words coming your way. A game is an electronic audiovisual experience communicated via ludological and thematic procedural rhetoric. Stay cool, we're going to walk through this step by step. Ludological comes from the Latin root ludir, which means to play, and ology, which means to study of. So here this means within the context of a game. Seriously guys, learn your Latin roots, they're so freaking useful. Enthymematic is the adjective form of enthymeme, which is a concept Aristotle came up with to describe a rhetorical argument in which one premise is missing, but the audience has enough information to complete it themselves. It's like a partially completed puzzle that you get to put together to understand the meaning. Here's a modern example of an enthymeme, the infamous Lyndon B. Johnson Daisy Girl video used to attack his running opponent, Barry Goldwater. Watch and see if you can catch the enthymematic message it's trying to send. stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Did you catch it? On the surface, it's saying, vote for Lyndon B. Johnson to prevent nuclear war. But it's leaving something out an implied argument that you, the viewer, get to piece together. Here it is. A vote for Goldwater is a vote for dead little girls. That's an enthymeme. Most of the rhetoric is there, but you get to fill in the final piece. Enthymemes can be very powerful for allowing the audience to feel engaged by completing the argument as if it were their own. How powerful? Enough to keep LBJ in office, evidently. Lastly, there is procedural. This one's easy. It means manner of proceeding or by the rules. You ever play a game where the content is procedurally generated? All that means is stuff, level design, and mean item placements, etc., is created by the rules set by the game designer instead of by hand. We've already talked about rhetoric, so procedural rhetoric is a term I like to use to describe what a game designer is trying to say by setting up a game's rules of play. I'll get back to rules of play in a bit. So what does this all mean together? Ludological and thematic procedural rhetoric, from now on referred to as leper, means rhetoric that is derived from a game's rules of play, insofar as the meaning is incomplete, except for a missing premise provided by you, the player. What's that missing piece? 
playing the game. You, the player, become one of the participants in the creation of the game as art through your own unique gaming experience. So why the complicated definition? That definition is a concise way of saying that games are fundamentally different from other mediums because of their unique attribute, rules of play fulfilled by a player, yet are similar in their property of communicating rhetoric. It's how these rules of play are shaped and how the player plays along with them that make games utterly unique among any other form of art. So it's pretty freaking important we understand this difference well, especially if we're studying convergence with other mediums. So what are rules of play? Rules of play are unique to every single game. They define the systems and mechanics that serve as the framework for the experience of the game. They encompass all the possibilities that can be explored within the experience. How do they do this? Let's take a look at a simple example everyone is familiar with, chess. The rules of chess state all of the little elements that come together to frame the experience of a chess game. These include the chessboard as the environment, the chess pieces and black and white teams as characters, the allowed and disallowed behaviors of each piece, as well as each player, and the goals and rewards for each player, namely to capture the enemy king. All of these elements come together to create a space of possibility, the possibility of a strategic turn-based battle of the wits between two players, who come into that space and fill it by playing the game. To recap, a game is an electronic audiovisual experience communicated via leper, meaning incomplete rhetoric made complete by the player's participation in the rules of play. So why the hell did I go into all of that detail? Two reasons, to illustrate the differences between video games and films, and because different critics approach game critique from different angles, and it's important to understand why. The ludological approach looks at games purely or primarily as play. To the ludologist, aesthetics and narrative are nice, but ultimately meaningless. What really matters is the game's rules of play above all else. To my understanding, Aaron Hansen is a good example of one who holds this view. So they had to, like most other developers at the time, resort to using the game to set its tone. Can you believe it? His sequelitis series is great. Go check it out. In contrast, the narratological approach looks at elements games share with other forms of media and tries to critique it mainly on its aesthetics and narrative, ignoring or minimizing its gameplay, or interpreting the gameplay in terms of the game's narrative. The late Roger Ebert held this view, and unfortunately concluded that video games could never be art because they paled in this category compared to the rich history of film and literature. I would agree with him that video games have a vast mountain to climb when it comes to maturation and acceptance into the fold of fine art, but Interestingly enough, he included his favorite game, chess, in his definition of art. I really dig what the ludologists are trying to do in establishing games as separate and apart from other forms of media at its core, but I believe aesthetics are not unimportant or meaningless. Why else would the Mass Effect franchise be so successful despite its rather basic and repetitive gameplay? Why are millions willing to sit through hours and hours of Metal Gear's operatic cutscenes? Likewise, narratologists seem to be trying to lend video games an air of legitimacy by using the same critical lens used for literature and film, and they aren't wrong to do so seeing as games are so heavily informed by cinematic and literary techniques due to every one of them having a camera's perspective, but this approach ultimately misses what makes games so fundamentally unique, namely Leper. Therefore, in looking at video games, I choose to use the same technique I use to analyze any piece of art, the holistic approach seeing the work as one unified whole, all of its parts coming together in balance. It's like the ludological and narratological approach mashed together. But more than that, I try to look at the context of the work, what works came before it, what factors of its production are meaningful and important, what techniques are used in the transmission of its rhetoric, are there any social or political factors at play during the production or release, what are the work's influences and references, what are critical responses to it, I hope you'll notice that this approach works equally as well to all forms of art, which is why it's so critical to understand games in light of Leper and how well that merges or fails to merge with other forms of art, such as film in our case. Let's put this holistic approach into practice by looking at the game Portal. Here's a quick breakdown. Portal is a science fiction, physics-based puzzle game with a clean, slick, modern art style and electronic soundtrack. Shell 
an imprisoned test subject in the labs of Aperture Science, seeks to confront the ominous and sarcastic GLaDOS computer program and escape the labs, but must first solve a variety of physics puzzles housed within a number of test chambers with the mysterious portal gun. The Argument Shell experiences the thrill and challenge of solving a wide variety of puzzles using the portal gun, and navigates through the eerily abandoned Aperture Labs to unlock the mystery of her imprisonment. She emerges victorious, though barely, but against all odds is dragged back into Aperture steps away from her release. Missing Premise You, the player, facilitate the argument by controlling Shell throughout Aperture Labs as she encounters GLaDOS, the companion cube, turrets, and other creations of Aperture Labs. The game is played by placing portals with the portal gun, teleporting through the portals, sending things through the portals, placing cubes and spheres, and pressing buttons to solve physics puzzles. The goal is to find and confront GLaDOS and escape Aperture Labs, but conflict is introduced by the number of puzzles standing in the player's way. Solving these puzzles rewards the player with progress further along Aperture Labs towards the exit, as well as darkly humorous dialogue from GLaDOS. We are pleased that you made it through the final challenge where we pretended we were going to murder you. The player wins by destroying GLaDOS and escaping Aperture Labs, and the player loses by failing to solve the puzzles or falling into harm's way via traps placed in the puzzles. However, the player may retry as often as he or she likes. Is that a fair assessment of the game? Keep in mind this is a basic report rather than a critique of the game. But do you see how this approach ties it all together? Now here's a challenge for you. How would you turn this experience into a film adaptation? It's not as easy as it sounds. Do you know why? It's because Portal has everything in common with film insofar as its aesthetics and narrative in delivering its rhetoric, but the key difference is Leper, something that can't possibly be directly transferred to film because film, by definition, is not interactive. The defining element that makes the game a game would be lost in the exchange. You can't have the same kind of experience you get with a game with a film. Not exactly the same, at least. A film is the same experience every time, and it is not structured as an enthymematic argument. It doesn't need any interaction from you, the viewer, for it to get its message across. It's passive consumption. On the other hand, a game is a slightly different experience every time, due to varying player input and it is structured as an enthymematic argument. You have to drive the experience forward to its completion. You're in control of the progress, not a projection reel or a video file. You complete the experience. It's active consumption. Is this a lost cause then to try to get films and games together? I don't believe so. After all, films and literature have enjoyed a long history of successful adaptations despite their differences. I think there's the potential for great films to be made, which deliver fantastic stories and captivating characters inspired by and faithful to video games. And I think games could be great adaptations of films that add immersive and engaging interaction and exploration on behalf of the player. Consider me to be a skeptical optimist. Comic books struggled to be adapted to film for a long time, but they found a way, didn't they? But it's critical to understand the differences between the mediums, whether they be comic books, films, or video games, and what is lost or gained in the exchange. It's up to us as consumers to hold the bar up high for adaptations to clear, celebrating the successes and punishing the failures. Hitman Agent 47, I'm looking straight at you. Before I wrap this up, I'd like to lay the groundwork for this series going forward. I want the bulk of this series to be exploring case studies of particular film adaptations or game adaptations in the hopes of finding good examples of both. I'm sure I will run into more bad ones than good, and I will dissect them, but it's about the journey, not the destination. I'll take detours every now and again to discuss related topics, such as the convergence of the film industry and game industry and their business practices, or the phenomenon of video games as tie-in products to movies. The release schedule will be one video every two weeks, God willing. Thanks for sticking through this video. I hope you learned something. If you enjoyed it, why not subscribe so you don't miss any more? In the meantime, I'd love to hear from you what you learned from this video and what you think makes a good game or film adaptation. Until next time, take care. I'll see you soon.